Greetings, good morning, and welcome to Mind the Moment. This, my friends, is our coffee house in the cloud, a place for us to gather, build community, get centered, and working together, unfold this present moment. It is July 14th, 2020, which all people of French extraction and their Francophile friends will immediately recognize as Bastille Day. This day commemorates a turning point in the French Revolution of 1789, in which the fort and prison known as the Bastille was breached and occupied by the citizens of Paris. Though no political prisoners were being housed within the walls of the Bastille at the time of its so-called storming, it had previously been host to many such prisoners. 70 years earlier, for example, the Bastille was the forced residence of Francois-Marie Auchouet, better known as the writer Voltaire, who spent 11 months in a windowless cell with 10-foot thick walls for the crime of penning a satirical critique of a government official. Voltaire would later go on to write, doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is an absurd one. Accordingly, another thing we might celebrate today is wise doubt, the sense that it is flexibility itself and openness in the face of change that not only shows strength, but helps us to grow it. I am John Roberts from Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare's Mindfulness Program, and I am thrilled to be navigating the ever-changing moods of history this morning with Zinat Potia, a wonderful instructor who has lent her considerable gifts to Cambridge Insight Meditation Center, Cambridge Health Alliance, eMindful, and much to our pleasure, Harvard Pilgrim's own mindfulness training program. Good morning, Zinat. Good morning, John, and a very warm welcome to everyone. I'm delighted to be with you this morning. So in just one moment, I will uh, ask Zinat to lead us into and then guide us through a 10-minute meditation. Following that, we'll do some Q&A and then wrap things up just around 9 a.m. At the bottom of your screen, you may have noticed the option to open up a chat box. Please use that chat box to type in any questions or comments you might have. We'd love to know what's on your mind today. On that note, Zinat, is there anything you'd like to ask the folks at home to comment on as we're getting started? Thank you, John. Yes, I would. So what I'd like you to um, reflect on this morning, just as a way for us to connect as a community and to check in and to um, begin to create this container of practice, to hold our practice, is if you could look back at any moments in your recent days where you felt a sense of ease, of a relaxation, of fully being connected to an activity that you were doing, or even if you were just resting, there was this sense of uh, being held in the present moment, fully inhabiting your experience. So it could have just been drinking a cool glass of lemonade, or listening to a piece of music, or taking a walk, um, anything at all where you felt this, uh, and a felt sense of well-being, ease, joy, and fully engaged in the moment. If you could share with us in the chat, it would be lovely to, to hear what your experiences have been and where you've touched that felt sense of present moment awareness. All right, ex excellent prompt. All right, while folks are uh, typing, oh, uh, uh, bonjour mes amis, it's morning. Uh, while folks are typing, I'd like to issue a big thanks to everyone for taking the time to be with us and with each other this morning. Uh, do keep in mind that only Zinat and I will be able to see anything that you type, and if we don't read uh, your particular question or comment out loud, please know that we do read and appreciate them all. Before we close, I will point out some other ways that you can keep in touch with us too. Oh my goodness, many things are coming in here this morning. Somebody says, uh, walking through the ocean, that's always a lovely feeling. Reading a book on my deck, listening to the birds, enjoying the breeze. Sitting on Wildcat Mountain on a sunny rock, looking out over the beautiful landscape. Well, I can, I can, I can really feel the texture of these. Uh, connecting in person with a friend, uh, socially distanced, of course, the person says. Having a socially distant visit with, uh, with, my, with my adult sons. Recently sitting, uh, uh, while sitting on my deck, it was a beautiful day and I was simply taking in the breeze and the sound of the birds. It felt healing and easeful. Taking a walk in the sun this morning, sitting on my deck with my sisters, 
floating on my back in the water, gazing at the sky and clouds. That's a very, it's a very brave thing to do here in the uh, New England ocean. When I play with my six month old grandson, walking my dog yesterday, and I'm just home from a year of friends. So thanks for the recognition of Bastille Day. Ah. <laughs> Uh, my son's uh, Zoom graduation, uh, sitting on our still boat, listening to the loons. That is a tremendous uh, uh, number of, of things right there. Uh, oh, it's one more, playing badminton. I think that's great. <laughs> okay, see that. Well, with all of that in mind, uh, let me turn it to you to uh, take, us, take us away. Okay, thank you, John. And thank you all for sharing those beautiful images. I felt like I've been um, whisked away <laughs> with your experiences. So let's transition to practice. So I invite you to come into a posture. So you may already be aware that there's four shapes in which we can practice mindfulness, sitting, standing, walking, lying down. You most often see the sitting shape but to feel invited to try. Walking might be a little bit tricky, but perhaps uh, standing or lying down could be interesting for you to explore. And if so, you know, if energy is feeling stuck, there's heaviness in the body, then standing up can, can help move and lift some of that. So if you choose standing, just making sure that you're standing with knees soft, feet hips width distance, and arms by your side, uh, head and neck, as if you were looking straight ahead. And if you're lying down, then choosing to lie down, not necessarily in a prone shavasana position, which can feel sometimes a little too open or threatening for folks lying on your side or curled up in a ball or any position lying down that feels nurturing to you. And this shape is has um, always been fascinating to me, but lately been a very rich part of my practice because you're doing lying down practice not to go to sleep, which is what we associate the shape with, but to awaken, to be fully aware in that prone posture. And then seating, as a, uh, being seated, of course, is here. And that's what John and I are in that shape. So if that's where you want to be, then you can find us. Shoulders are just draping down. Head and neck is very relaxed. And allowing the spine to be upright. And I'm going to invite you to close the eyes if you're prefer to have them open, please do. Just make sure that the gaze is soft and that you're looking at a steady point in front of you. And to know that whatever I offer is just some guidance. You know, take what's useful and modify what doesn't work for you. You're always in agency and choice in mindfulness practice and in the rest of your life. So just to reiterate that. Do what works for your body and your mind and your heart. Starting to come in to presence. Connecting the bottoms of the feet, if you're seated or standing, to the ground, to the earth energy that's here. And as we root, if you're lying down, you're rooting with all parts of the body that are contacting the surface. We can begin to notice where there is bracing or constriction, or gripping in the body. You know, and we each have our own unique bodies. So maybe it's tension in the face, the abdomen, the hands, shoulders is a common hot spot of stress. Is it possible to allow some of that clenching and gripping to ease, to relax? And then see if you can channel it down. The earth um, is beloved and spacious and strong and can hold our discomfort, can hold our sorrow. And then as you begin to experience a little bit of release, 
I invite you to play with the counterbalance, the creative opposition of as we root down, we rise up, we rise up. And I have an image in my mind when I offer this teaching, uh, especially now in this season of sunflowers, reaching for the light. And so in this moment now, aligning to whatever arises spontaneously as an intention for your practice right now and an intention for the rest of your day. What do you want to aspire to, to reach for? And not in a striving, efforting way, but just like sunflowers in a very organic, tender, moment to moment exploration of an intention for your practice, for your life for your day. Softening the body opening the heart to tenderness and steadying the mind right here and right now. Perhaps choosing to work with breath awareness, just aware of the body sitting, standing or lying, here breathing. Or awareness of external sounds that are arising and passing away, or awareness of sensations in the body. And the more we study, the more we can open to this orientation of internal awareness, what's happening internally for you, and external awareness, what's happening externally, and then integrating the two internal and external awareness at the same time as we study more. If this seems complicated or nerve wracking, then just stick to one form of awareness. If the mind and heart feel ready to be a little creative, to experiment with dual awareness, then practicing in that way. So choosing for yourself. In the last 30 seconds or so of practice remaining, actually, I think I want to continue for a couple more minutes. So bear with, bear with me, or enjoy, continue to enjoy sustained present moment awareness. Is an invitation to simply begin again. If you've been away, it's not a problem. Returning. And if you're interested to end 
the next couple of minutes with some loving kindness practice, I would like to offer just one phrase that's been very alive for me in my practice currently, which is you can say and you can offer to yourself, may I be well, may I be well. So it's a dropping in. We say the phrase over and over again, but it's not a practice of repetition. It's a practice of deep listening, of dropping in this aspiration for ease, for well-being, for acceptance with a loving gaze for things just the way they are, without trying to change or control or fix. And so when we feel the lick, the flames of agitation, of impatience, of annoyance arising, you can offer, may I be well. You know, now in the sitting is a training that we're doing. And then when you're out in the world, when you're in relationship to other beings and you experience unease, you can offer, may I be well. May I be well. You can offer it to different parts of your own body, starting from the tippy toes of the feet or the top of the head. May you be well. May you be well. May you be well. And now preparing and beginning to transition out of the practice. So taking your time, opening the eyes if they were closed, looking around the room or a window if there is one to integrate the practice that we practice with focus in order to expand a sense of spaciousness or our consciousness. So that doing it with the eyes is an embodied way to learn that. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Zena. I felt like I was really developing a relationship with that bird. And the thing what's, what's so great about it is like, it's the, the repetition of its call was like the repetition of the may I be well in my head. Mm -hmm. I felt it was, uh, it was a very resonant, uh, 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 matching um, and uh, for you know the folks who uh, who just participated with us uh, Zenith instruction at the beginning was a set an intention for the practice and perhaps for your day as well if you connected with that instruction and did so and would like to share the intention that you set please uh, feel free to do so just for myself I was feeling uh, your instructions in that about uh, posture uh, helped me I think get into even a bit better of a posture than I normally would. And that sense of feeling poised became my intention. I, I felt mm -hmm. like I want to bring that sense of poise throughout the rest of my, of my day. Um, and it also, I, it reminds me how, how difficult it really is to get into a position that is relaxed, but at the same time alert. A lot of times at the beginning of my practice, I will get into a position that I think is relaxed and alert. And only after several minutes do I realize I've been like, like holding a shoulder or something for, you know, and it's that, pro I mean, so part of my beginning again in my own practice is, you know, realizing that I can let go of some of the tension, which I didn't even realize. And, uh, you know, and then begin again with a little more of a relaxed posture. So. Good. Good. So, Zina, so we, uh, I, I, I'm going to um, uh, cite myself for failing to, to uh, properly prep this part with you. I, uh, we had spoken briefly a couple of days ago about um, mindfulness in daily life, and I wasn't sure if there was anything you wanted to present on that before we got into a more of a proper Q&A period. Um, thank you, John. I think I'll just say something very brief, which is, um, you know, really this... Um, practice is not limited to our cushion or our chair when we're doing the formal practice. That's the training of the mind, but it's the 
integrating of mindfulness all the time as you're moving through the day, um, getting into a rhythm of uh, constantly asking what's happening right now, where am I right now, and connecting to activity, whatever you're doing, um, so that mindfulness becomes more seamless and more available. And of course, the more formal practice we do, the more accessible and possible this mindfulness in daily life becomes. But it's so simple, yet really is the heart of our practice. Our life is our practice. Thank you. All right, so um, I, I want to make sure that uh, all the folks watching feel very welcomed and even encouraged to ask Zunash questions using the chat box. While you think and type, uh, I will uh, get us going uh, with uh, one or two questions of my own. So Zina, you, you recently wrote a, a lovely piece for the Cambridge Insight Meditation Center newsletter in which you quote uh, New York Times columnist Charles M. Blow describing the fight for racial justice as a forever commitment, something that we must maintain energy for even after protest eventually subsides. Then uh, you go on to compare this entreaty to Cambridge Insight founder Larry Rosenberg's guidance to be cautious in mindfulness practice of privileging artificial flowers over real ones. In other words, being cautious not to cling to the parts of practice and activism that are convenient or may merely feel good in lieu of those parts that may result in actual lasting change. So actually, I actually have, have a few interlocking questions, but I'll ask them one at a time. And the first one is simply, how can you tell the difference between the artificial and the real flowers of practice? Um, thank you, John, for reading my piece and for these very insightful questions. I would say that um, one easy and quick way to clue into the artificial flowers nature of practice, which, you know, um, when we first come to practice, um, to know what the why is, to be very clear of why we practice. And often it's for a desire for self-improvement, which is a wholesome aspiration. You know, we want to better ourselves, but that is um, really the tip. It's not the entirety of the path. The path is not about uh, fixing or sleeping better or being better. We might have those outcomes, but really it's aligning to the deeper values of this practice, the ethical underpinnings of mindfulness, that it is um, a path that aligns to what most matters to us in our, in our lives. So it's really a, a taking a very big picture view of what this um, practice asks of us. And it's not something that we do, uh, you know, like um, checking off a, a 30 day calendar or doing a challenge for X number of days. It's something that once we start to orient towards practicing with um, values and ethics and how we move through the world, then, then it's a lifetime, it's a, the practice of a lifetime and, and I see this interconnectedness with um, commitment to a path of awakening where artificial flowers, you know, the fruit will be very limited. They won't have the aliveness, um, the difficulty. I mean, real flowers bloom and they're very fragrant and then they decay, they decay and they die. Um, and there's a real sense there of aliveness. And it's the same with our path of commitment to racial justice. You know, if we do it to look good or to do performative allyship, or when, as you say, when it's convenient, um, then it's, it's in a way, it's artificial, it's not real. Um, and so what does true commitment look like? It's, um, it's definitely not going to be easy. It's a hell of a lot of it. Um, there will be, it'll be paved with difficulty because it's grappling with real challenges with um, a human beings, uh, reckoning with history, um, doing the hard work of how we want to move forward. Um, so, so, you know, interesting, interesting work to be done and interesting ways to uh, approach it. Um, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, so I mean, let me, uh, let me e even dig a little deeper because you said uh, something that I thought was really interesting in the piece. Um, 
so you mentioned that the the protest the protest movement we've recent, recently seen being activated is causing you to ask yourself how you might personally undo what you refer to as your own internalized racism. Now, for a white man like myself, that particular call to action looks like one thing, looks like one particular thing. But what what does it look like for you, and and how might mindfulness be an aid for you in that? Um. So I would say that that's a very, very complicated question and I'm, I'm exploring it, you know, actively, but um, as a person of color, I think that you internalize um, a lot of conditioning and messaging from the world in which you uh, move and, um, you know, experiencing racism externally and then how does that become an internal lens of, um, of ickiness is the word that's coming to mind. Um, it's painful and it's uncomfortable um, being a South Asian. You know, I've grown up in communities in India where there's a lot of anti-Black sentiment. Um, and I have always been um, a champion um, right from childhood um, and especially the cause of apartheid in South Africa has been near and dear to my heart. And the, the school that I went to, we, we were trained, you know, to to sing spiritual songs from um, the slave times and just, just feel very connected to an African and African-American experience. And so I didn't have that lens. I had more of wanting to speak out and push out against that. But other, just other lenses of, um, there would be advertising in India growing up of creams called Fair and Lovely. Um, and again, I never used them, but I took in that messaging that, you know, fair and, or my grandmother would say, oh, don't go, go out in the bright sun, you'll, you'll get dark. Um, so a lot of different things, but the one tool from mindfulness practice that I can bring to this work that's ongoing, will be ongoing throughout my life, is self-compassion. Mm -hmm. Is this ability to see clearly what is arising, what is at play, and to meet it with a heart of compassion because the compassion has the capacity to hold that pain, the intergenerational trauma, the ancestral um, internalized racism, all of it. And then, and then the compassion does its magic, um, allows it to metabolize, allows it to move. So let me, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you for that, for sharing that. Um, and let me, let me just ask you something that, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly where to take this question, but do you think there's anything about the way that we have been taught or that we tend to teach mindfulness in the West that prefers a particular lens at, while perhaps um, suppressing a different uh, type of lens or temperament? I'm not sure. Is that, is that coming across? Um, I'm not really following. Yeah, well, I wonder, like, is there a way that, that the way we teach mindfulness that actually uh, is taught from a white perspective, I guess, is um, as opposed to a perspective that is maybe more um, inclusive, uh, uh, unwittingly, of course, but I mean. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Um, and I think that there is, you know, work is underway, which I'm really, really happy to see of um, amplifying teachers of color, of um, incorporating more um, examples and stories of broader uh, lived experience. I think one thing that I have appreciated uh, of the way mindfulness is offered here is that um, taking away some of the cultural baggage and the ritualism, um, you know, again, it's complicated, but that has been uh, kind of refreshing to me. But then I think when you take some stuff away, you also lose some of the richness so it's striking um, a balance where you can um, really focus in on the heart of the practice, but then start to include some of the richness that may have been left away. And also so that um, people who, don't, who aren't white um, feel welcome and feel included and feel like their voices and their stories are part of Dharma. You know, I remember um, a teacher, Eugene Cash, who I sat at a retreat with, he's out in California many, many years ago, um, said this, and it really touched part of try to see the teachings and this is from a, it was a buddhist perspective but try to see the teachings outside or beyond the robes of a monk see the dharma everywhere you know and i um i've lived by that so see the teachings and even when they're not in the guise of um the robes of a monk that's that's wonderful thank i mean i really appreciate uh you you taking on um those uh 
these, these, this inquiry with me today. I, I appreciate that quite a bit. Uh, so I, I'm going to move us towards the ending here, unfortunately. Uh, and I just wanted to let folks know that we are continuing to appreciate all the responses we've gotten to our show us your meditation sweet spot challenge. Now we've asked our instructors to themselves offer images of the places where they like to meditate. Zina, we showed uh, yours uh, on um, uh, last Friday. And uh, this is from Shanti Douglas, um, uh, one of our instructors in New Hampshire. And she uh, actually created this labyrinth for herself for walking meditation, one of the forms of meditation that you were mentioning, Zina, earlier. Uh, this is Tara Healy has sent us another one. Uh, this is uh, her one of her very cozy meditation spaces. And I felt like it was important for me to maybe throw in one more of my own. This was from my back porch. Now, this was done back in the late spring where there was less greenery on the trees. But around dusk in the gloaming, you get a very nice lattice work out of, uh, out of the back porch. And I find this is a place that brings me a, a bit of peace, which I appreciate. So, uh, folks, you know, uh, we'd love to see where you are meditating this summer. Where, where's your meditation sweet spot? Please do post a picture to our Facebook page if you like. That's facebook.com slash mindthemoment. Or you can send those pictures to us directly at askmtm at harvardpilgrim.org. Feel free to submit more than one if you like. We know your meditation sweet spot may change day to day depending on where you are where your travels are taking you. You can also leave questions for our experts. We will pass them along and get them answered. You can leave a voicemail at my desk number if you prefer. That's 617-509-7047. We are back with you every Tuesday and Friday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. You can find the links to these sessions and other resources at our main site at harvardpilgrim.org slash mindfulness. And you can find uh, these uh, this session, uh, recordings of a uh, uh, the older sessions as well and introductory sessions on our YouTube page. And so just as we're closing, um, I'm uh, reminded of a, another quote from Voltaire, namely, quote, the more I read, the more I acquire, the more certain I am that I know nothing. Uh, though he also said, let us read and let us dance two amusements that will never do any harm to the world. So even knowing that we may always know less than we could and may never do quite as much as we may like to, I hope that we can continue forth doing everything we can in as harmless a way as possible. Zenet, I want to thank you for clearing a path for us and our practice this morning um, and for taking on this, uh, this uh, dialogue. I I'm wondering if you might leave us with one resource that you think people would find particularly useful as they continue to grow their practice. Just the one I offered in the sitting, I'd like to offer it again. You know, the phrase, may I be well. Fantastic. I think that's wonderful. Thank you, Zina. Thank you again. Uh, thank you for joining everyone, and we will see you soon. Have a momentous day. Thank you, John. <laughs>